Well, I'm excited today because our guest, Cal Turner Jr., is a legend in business. He helped uh, create his family's business and make it uh, a massive business. Dollar General is a store that has impacted the communities uh, all across the nation, and he uh, helped grow it. But I'm also interested because not only is his story a business success, but he also is someone that embodies the principles that we talk about so often here, which is servant leadership. And he, he lives and leads that way. And he's also from my adopted hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. Exactly. Uh, makes me miss uh, home. Uh, uh -huh. But his, his new book, uh, this terrific new book, My Father's Business, is, is, a, is a book that's not just about business lessons and entrepreneurship, leadership lessons, but also it's filled with life lessons. It's really for everyone. It's, it's not just for business leaders. It's for people who want to live and design a better life. So thank you for being here today. I'm delighted and thank you, Skip. Well, thank you. Your, your grandfather started this company, your father continued it, and I was struck by him reading the newspaper, this advertisement, studying the mass merchandisers, and the day everything changed, this epiphany he had. And yes. I'd love for you to just give us a little perspective on uh, what happened and why it changed everything. My father considered himself to be a country boy who tried to observe what the city boys were doing. And he noticed that they had a very effective sale called dollar days, everything at one dollar, and they ran a full page color ad in the newspaper, which cost a bunch. So it was a success. And he thought, no, wait a minute. Why can't we have a store where every day is dollar day? That should work in our stores with our customers. And uh, he g gathered his management team around him, and he went through all of his reasoning for why it would work. And then he said, what do you think? What do you think? And to a person, they said, it'll never work. <laughs> it will never work. And so there he got a little more challenged to see if it would work. And he decided that a great test would be to take a store building in which they had lost money operating a retail store and put this new concept there, this dollar store, and he put general in the name because he was a great buyer and he wanted to sell anything that he bought. So that's a general store, right? So it'll be dollar general store in Springfield, Kentucky. And, wow. and it worked. And it, it did worked. work. What a story. And you took over the helm from him after this idea from this, this newspaper grew uh, somewhat. And I think in 1977. And that transition, I'm struck by, leadership transitions always interest me. I've been through them myself. Sometimes they go well, sometimes yes. they're challenging. Yes. I think it's hard in any business. I think it's much harder when you have a family dynamic and I've seen that as well. That family dynamic adds a whole new dimension. But I'd love to talk, your candor in this book about that. You, you don't hold back. Your rawness, your, your, your feelings are really here, which I think makes it so much more powerful than just the nine steps to take or something. Oh, I'd, yes. I'd love for you to just talk about what that transition was like from your father to you and how, how leaders should be looking at transitions. This book largely is about that transition, which occurred over many years. Now, in 1977, you mentioned, I became president, and the Wall Street Journal <laughs> review of the books started off with the observation that my dad announced to me that I would become president while sitting on the john, and I heard it through the closed door between us. <laughs> and then the journal said, so much for her corporate succession. Uh, 
<laughs> that's, that's the way you do it in the country. That's the way. <laughs> but my father wanted me at the age of 25, when I first came in the business with him, to take over. He felt that it had already grown beyond his management style as an entrepreneur, and he was the quintessential entrepreneur. And he wanted me just to take it over. Well, I, the day I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't ready to take it over. And, <laughs> but uh, it was, it really was a father-son partnership in leadership development that would position the first non-Turner to have success as CEO of that company in the future. That is how I went at it. It was, it was my father's business. It was his baby. And my job was to get it from that entrepreneurial chaos to success as a well-managed public company so that you didn't have to be a turner to manage its quirkiness and to succeed. <laughs> well, you did that. Uh, you definitely succeeded. At... Well, it happened. I would not say that I did that. <laughs> it took many people. Well, many it took, people. took many people and it, it took your leadership. I, I was struck by early in the book, you talk about your childhood and I am remembering it almost as the, a tale of two piano teachers. I don't know um, <laughs> what it's titled, but you, you, you had, uh, you, you, you really had two. I think um, your aunt and Mrs. Reed uh, were the yes. two. And, uh, and, and the way you paint the picture of your aunt uh, teaching you is quite humorous, but that had an impact. And early early things that happened to us in childhood have such an impact on how we manage and how we lead. How did that, uh, how did those, the tale of two piano teachers impact your leadership long after that transition happened from your father to you? Where else but in this book would you have management style contrast by way of two piano teachers. <laughs> I haven't seen it before, must admit. No, no, exactly. But um, they were stark contrast. One really worked with me. The other was a major turnoff. And it, it really did help me to define that guilt and blame are not the purview of a leader. A leader is one who empowers others. A leader is one who helps others to want to dig deeper into themselves and to be part of a success that's bigger than they are. Well, my second piano teacher affirmed me in every way and I did my best. To, I didn't have that much music talent, but I did my best to perform for Mrs. Reed. A leader inspires someone to go for his or her best and to bring it to bear on a greater success. And the success of our company was defined in those two words serving others. Life and, and real success is about serving others, not about serving self. And so well that, defi that defined the company beautifully into its future. And today, that is still the mission statement of Dollar General, serving others. And that company today is being run so much better than the Turners did. <laughs> and, and this Turner takes great pride in the success of Turner's successors in that business.
Well, you're you're very humble as you uh, approach that, and and I appreciate your. I don't even understand humility. <laughs> I don't I don't know how that is defined. <laughs> well, you know, it it strikes me that uh, you, as you talk about a leader and the leader encouraging and the leader being like that piano teacher, and and pointing the way and and help guiding, and yet, as I read your story, you still hold people accountable. You don't uh, paint a rosy picture and everything's always good. You, you, you did blend those two things. And I think that's often something that leaders are challenged with. How do you motivate and encourage while also holding people accountable for doing what they say they're going to do and having the integrity to be who they are and do what they say all along? Is that uh, fair? Well, I would say that a true leader goes for the accountability of self in the other person. I found that there is a higher level of accountability and performance when the other person sets his bar or her bar, not when I try to set it. And a leader tries to inspire others to figure out what's the highest and best they can go for. And that gives greater success than the leader himself or herself would define. I love that. I love that. Let's, we're talking about leadership, we're talking about service, talking about the mission of the company. I want to talk, and we're talking about dollars. So I want to talk <laughs> about service and I want to talk about dollars and, and a quote that I was reading in this book that, uh, that I think got you into a little bit of trouble early on, a magazine cover that <laughs> said, our mission is not to make money and I don't believe the CEO who describes his mission as making money is fully worthy of his responsibility. And you know what I love oh. about that? I know it must have gotten you into trouble but yes, you know, you were way ahead of your time in that today, millennials and the next generation say money's not enough. We need a social mission. We need purpose. We need a why. We need a cause. It's not good enough to make money. Those ideas are now big today on Wall Street. But back in the 80s and in, in the days of uh, Wall Street and those things, that's not exactly what you would hear. So how was that re received? It was, I was in hot water over that, <laughs> and I was trying to get people to understand what a mission is by saying what a mission is not. Making money is an objective. A mission is far more profound than just an objective of making money. And Dollar General succeeded when it explored how it is different from other retailers. We observed that other retailers copy the competition. We wanted to explore our uniqueness and our opportunity to meet a real need of our customer. And today, that company is delivering value in the consumable basics all over the country. Did you know that 75% of the population of the continental United States lives within five miles of a Dollar General store? And that will become an increasing percentage in the future. Isn't that wonderful? Amazing. Well, we, we said, we don't want to be a retailer. That's pretty shocking. We want to be a customer-driven distributor of consumable basics. Those few words gave us our future on a strategic platter. It's fantastic. You know, you're very candid in the book about uh, difficulties, about things that you wrestled with, and about your or other uh, mistakes that you were making along the way. 
Uh, and I wrote a book about mistakes, mistakes uh, I think leaders can learn from. I'm, I'm curious, what role does mistakes and the mistakes we make have in uh, fueling a leader's development? Well, I was blessed by making mistakes that were whoppers. <laughs> <laughs> blessed by it. And yes, because it's perhaps easier to learn from the mistake. Every mistake is an opportunity to learn. But you have to be the right student. And you have to be in a place of learning. And the mistakes that I made literally brought me to my knees. And I needed to go for a bigger objective. So there, there, when, when things aren't working at important fundamental levels, sometimes a leader is out of touch with that. And if a mistake occurs that gives the leader opportunity to be in touch with the real problem here, quite often there isn't enough problem-solving genius in an organization. Now, at Dollar General, that genius was in the stores where the problems were. It wasn't in corporate enclave of, of uh, the headquarters. It's out there in the stores. Your own people can tell you what's not working. Well, um, the real trauma of my career lay in the near carnage of the company when we were in trouble. And I had to make the decision of whether to terminate my brother, who was chief operating officer. He and I couldn't agree, and we had to change. That, that was mistake on steroids. And that helped to put the company together in a different way after we split the family and split the company. That was literally scary as hell. Very, di very difficult. And, and, I, and I try to share that, Skip, in a way that'll help any reader to more thoughtfully explore the potential of mistakes, of pain, of loss, of things not going right, because that's where you get tested in life, when things aren't working. And I tried to share the not workings of my life in a way that would help the not workings of the life of any reader. Well, you do it extraordinarily well. And I, I want to ask you one, one final question because I'm, I'm reflecting, I, I worked for the Ingram family, very philanthropic family in Nashville. Indeed, you indeed. You were wonderful people. Your family is known to be incredibly philanthropic. And um, you, you tried to maintain small town values even as you scaled the business. And it's also uh, evident that your spiritual development and your spiritual side was important as you led the business. How do those things interrelate in terms of small town values and your spiritual side and uh, philanth phil <coughs> philanthropy and giving back to the community and to, to others? How does that inform your mission of your, of, of your life? Wow, that's a profound question. I can see why you saved it for last. <laughs> um, in, in the book, written 15 years after retirement, I try to dig into all of that, Skip. Um, while in the job, I didn't feel the freedom 
to share from my heart. This, in this book, I try to share what happened, and I try to share from my heart. I try to bring the reader into all of that. Um, I give my witness of, of my conversion experience and of the rest of my life after the age of 11, when that happened, of trying to figure out what that meant. My grandfather, who was a co-founder of the company at the age of 11, became the head of the family, and he only had a third grade education. His father was killed. It happened to him at 11. At 11, I had my experience, and I was overwhelmed. I didn't understand what it meant, and I realized it meant I was going to be asking, what does that mean for the rest of my life? And a leader is one who helps everybody to ask a better question. And in small towns where everybody knows everybody, the questions are more penetrating. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't fool the people around you when you're in a little town as well, I don't think, as you might in the city. So it all did come together. Uh, what happened to me and to that company was beyond my planning, but it was up to me to discover the opportunity at hand. And by sharing that, Skip, I hope any reader is more challenged to discover the opportunity at hand in the life of the reader. You do it extraordinarily well. I think this book is uh, from the heart. Cal Turner Jr., uh, an extraordinary story. Like I said, business lessons, leadership lessons, but most important to me, life lessons. It's an extraordinary story. I love the fact that we did see into your heart and you took us through your life in such a compelling way that we can learn from it and uh, learn those lessons from you. So thank you for, thank, you didn't have to do this. This to, this to me is part of your giving back to write this book, My Father's Business. It, it is the small town values that built Dollar General <clears throat> into a billion dollar company. It's, it's so much more than that. And I think the subtitle would have to go on and on. Thank and you, so, Skip. It, it only you. took eight years to write. <laughs> eight, only eight years. Only eight years, yes. So uh, in that eight years, you packed a lot into it, and uh, we, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you for your time, and thank you for sharing your uh, values and story with us. Thank you, Skip. God bless you. You too.